I'm Claudia Colton, professor at the Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences here at Case Western Reserve University. Joining me today is Tom Segrew, the Kahn Professor of History and Sociology at the University of Pennsylvania. Today we're going to be discussing Tom's book, The Origins of the Urban Crisis. Welcome, Tom. Thanks for having me. Tom, I was wondering um, what drew, drew you to Detroit and its neighborhoods as a way to really discover um, and theorize about the origins of the urban crisis? Well, people's projects come from a number of different impulses, and my focus on Detroit grew out of my personal experience as someone who was born and raised in the city, but also um, out of my intellectual interests. Um, I was particularly, particularly concerned with looking at the interconnections between race and um, economic change, and Detroit offered a really good case study for that. I grew up in Detroit um, at, at a moment of really profound transformation, and it's one that even as a child, when I didn't really have the, you know, the vocabulary or the analytical skills to, to understand what was going on, I knew that there were big changes afoot. Um, this was the Detroit of the 1960s and, and 1970s. So um, one of my earliest childhood memories was the Detroit riot or uprising of 1967, which I remember because the first full day of the riot was my fifth birthday. Uh, and National Guard vehicles and personnel carriers rolled down Fankel Avenue just a half block uh, from my house. And so that left an impression on me as a child. But I also lived in a neighborhood that I didn't know at the time, but was undergoing a process of racial change that was very common in, uh, in post-war cities. Um, my neighborhood in Northwest Detroit went from being all white to mostly African American in a period of about four years. Um, to me, as a child, this was racial integration because I lived in a, uh, a street with black and white neighbors with friends who were African American and friends who were white. Um, but what I didn't know is actually this was a, a very fleeting moment as um, the neighborhood resegregated um, from being segregated white to segregated African American. So that's the personal side of the story. And, and did you feel, though, that Detroit was prototypical in some way of, um, of a certain type of city, a certain era, um, a certain path that would be generalizable to, to other parts of the country? Yeah, I looked at Detroit in some ways because it was such an important city for most of 20th century America. In a way, it was the epitome of 20th century American capitalism, technology, industrial might. This was the home of the automobile industry, which was the single most important industry, arguably, in, in modern America for so many reasons. Um, in part, it, you know, the auto industry employed directly or indirectly about one in every six working Americans um, in the mid-20th century. And so what happened in Detroit had local but also national and international consequences. And so part of my interest in Detroit was because of its, 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 its real um, economic power and might. Also because it's a city that has become synonymous with racial tension and um, racial hostility in the United States. It's the, the first or second most segregated metropolitan area um, in the United States and has been for most of the second half of the 20th century. So it allowed me, Detroit, to, to look at questions of economic change and industry and jobs, and, um, but also to explore questions of race and race relations. And, um, and, and what impact they have on politics and on everyday life. Mm -hmm. and, and in reading your book, um, I was struck because um, sometimes you hear people kind of dismiss the problem of race, racial segregation as a, a problem of people's choices, free choice, and, uh, um, and that, that is often the way people think about it. But, um, I noticed you learned a lot about the role that organizations and political institutions um, have played in the history of Detroit and how uh, the relations between the races and especially the s spatial distribution of um, African Americans and whites uh, tur has turned out in Detroit. Could you say something about the um, organizations and the politics? Yeah, well, we, we tend to in, in politics and policymaking and popular culture to think about people's residence as a matter of individual choice, as a, an expression of individual preferences. It's, it's simply the market working to reflect um, uh, the sum of individual choices. And that if racial segregation exists, it's, the argument goes, the, it's the consequence of um, like wanting to live with like, whites wanting to live with their like, African Americans wanting to live with their like. Um, 
but what I discovered when I was doing my, my work on Detroit and what I've discovered in doing work on other cities is that um, the process of, of where people live is not a matter of individual choice solely or primarily. Um, people's choices are shaped. They're shaped by real estate brokers. They're shaped by federal policy. Um, they're shaped by um, perceptions in a neighborhood will be hostile or welcoming. And, and those are um, external uh, forces that, that determine where people live that can't simply be boiled down to the invisible hand of the market or the sum of individual choices. So real estate brokers um, were critical in determining where people lived. Um, uh, they engaged in practices like steering, which is showing houses um, to whites in predominantly white neighborhoods and showing houses to African Americans in predominantly black neighborhoods or racially transitional neighborhoods. Um, in the period that I write about, real estate brokers were often involved in speculating. Um, that is, getting whites to panic that their houses were going to lose value and encouraging them to sell quickly, often at a lower price, uh, and then reselling the house to African Americans who were um, eager to live in racially mixed uh, neighborhoods and to, to live in better housing. And so um, they benefited from that profit. But there were also federal policies that were critical in determining where people lived. Um, the federal government underwrote the mortgage market in ways that were profound, that completely remade metropolitan America. So when you look out at, at Detroit or Cleveland and, and look at the process of suburbanization, um, the large-scale suburbanization that we associate with modern America, single-family detached homes, you know, decent-sized lots, um, uh, uh, these were not just the result of individual preferences. These were um, subsidized by federal uh, mortgage underwriting that made it possible for developers to do big-scale developments and made it possible for um, ordinary middle-class and even working-class Americans to buy their own homes. But they came with a big string attached. Those uh, mortgage guarantees were not available to developers who would um, build houses for I integrated or mixed use uh, you know, by whites or African Americans, and they weren't largely available to older urban neighborhoods, and they weren't, for the most part, available to neighborhoods with any number of African Americans, small or large, living in them. So this was a huge benefit uh, that went disproportionately to whites and didn't go to African Americans and shaped the racial divisions that we still see in our metropolitan areas of communities that are overwhelmingly white and communities that are mostly African American. And I noticed in your um, book, and I was su uh, surprised, I guess I had been I ignorant of um, uh, the role that um, government agencies actually played in what we think of perhaps as redlining, um, and that it, it wasn't um, simply private decision makers who were taking those positions, but there were, were some underlying uh, support for that. That's right. Um, the Homeowners Loan Corporation, which was one of the federal agencies that um, helped to bolster the housing finance and home mortgage market, um, beginning in the 1930s, prepared maps. Um, I, I've seen some of the, you can get them at the National Archives in Washington, and the maps divide um, city neighborhoods into four categories. Um, they're colored, gr red meaning the least credit worthy, um, green and blue meaning the most credit worthy. Um, likewise, um, the maps categorized neighborhoods and had little descriptions accompanying them from A through D, A being um, places that were credit worthy or worthy of getting mortgage assistance, and D being neighborhoods that were considered to be actuarially unsound or risky. The D neighborhoods were almost always neighborhoods with African Americans living in them um, or old um, working class um, industrial neighborhoods mm -hmm. in central cities. Let me re um, just take you up to a, a modern concern that uh, some people have had uh, that's similar to what you've just described about classifying neighborhoods as A, B, C, and D. Um, um, market research companies now are, are very busy uh, and successful in using massive amounts of credit data and using data mining techniques to try to classify neighborhoods uh, and, and releasing that, those classifications to all kinds of decision makers, um, not just businesses, but uh, a, wi a wide range of decision makers. Do you see any parallels? Um, in that kind of classification today? I do. I've gone online and looked at some of these um, neighborhood classification systems. They're a lot more subtle and sophisticated than the ABCD model that the Homeowners Loan Corporation did, but um, they have um, the possibility of be becoming um, 
uh, self-fulfilling prophecies. That is, if a neighborhood is perceived by those who are doing these classifications as a working class neighborhood or a poor neighborhood or a neighborhood with mixed economic fortunes or a neighborhood that's moving down rather than moving up, um, that can have a pretty significant impact on the decisions of folks who are thinking about investing in real estate and starting businesses, um, investing in neighborhood commercial districts. And look, most investors in, in cities and suburbs are cautious, they're conservative, they're looking to minimize the risk that they take. And if they have a, a, an objective report that says that this neighborhood has got problems or is on the skid, uh, then their lack of investment can actually continue that downward trajectory for neighborhoods. Or vice versa, if they see a neighborhood that's supposedly on the upswing, um, an infusion of additional resources can, can, can propel that neighborhood on forward. Would you, would you think that um, the power of, of those tools then being out there um, may be based on incomplete information? I assume in the A, B, C, and D method was also based on inc a, a point of view and, and a certain type of information. But uh, when I read the stories of the people who were living in the neighborhoods and how eager they were to have housing, for example, and how much they would have put in if it was only sweat equity into, um, into keeping up their homes. It, it seems like there was really false information underlying the... Yeah, and I think about the neighborhood where I live in Northwest Philadelphia, and I've looked at a couple of different companies' classifications of our neighborhood, and they're really different from each other. And the reason is my neighborhood isn't easy, easily categorized. Mm -hmm. Like many early 20th century, late 19th, early 20th century urban neighborhoods, it's got a mix of housing. There are apartments, there are small attached houses and row houses, there are um, medium size and, and, and even giant mansions. Um, it's also racially heterogeneous. There are um, uh, a, a slight majority of re residents in my neighborhood are African American, um, but there are also a lot of white folks living there. Um, it's economically heterogeneous. The folks living in the giant mansions um, uh, have incomes that put them in the very you know, top income bracket of metropolitan Philadelphia, but you know, three quarters of a mile away, you'll find people living in row houses who are, are um, mostly of working class background. And so how do you classify this neighborhood? Which description of it is the correct one? Hard to say. Uh, depends on what vantage point um, you use. So I think these tools um, have to be used very, very carefully and with a, a real grain of salt. Let me um, take you to a different topic, uh, with, again, within your book. Um, I um, wondered if you could talk a little bit about the sort of pushback um, that occurred from uh, various uh, groups, uh, uh, minority groups, uh, disadvantaged groups, um, when all these forces were, were overtaking them. Uh, what about fair housing action? What about civil rights actions? Uh, what, what happened and what, what were the results? Yeah, well this is something I wrote about in Origins of the Urban Crisis um, a little bit and it's actually the subject of a whole new book that I just finished um, called Sweet Land of Liberty, The Unfinished Struggle for Racial Equality in the North, where I'm looking at the entire um, northern part of the United States and cities, suburbs, small towns. And the post-Second World War II period witnessed a, a real explosion of grassroots civil rights activism around inequality in housing, around segregated and unequal education, around the exclusion of African Americans from hotels, restaurants, swimming pools, around um, discrimination in the workplace. And so some of this I write about in Detroit. Um, there were especially you know, challenges to um, segregated housing and attempts to open up the housing market through, um, through protest, through petitions, um, through grassroots activism. And um, uh, it's, I think it's a, it's a really important story in um, bringing the agency of African Americans and, Af and interracial activists to, to, to the forefront of the story. But it's, it's a story that um, is one of defeat as much as it is a story of victory. That is, despite the real creative tactics that a lot of these activists used, um, they were fighting um, with few weapons against a foe with re a real formidable arsenal. Um, you know, the real estate industry, uh, federal government, local city governments, uh, um, these were large, well-financed, uh, and, and really difficult foes to challenge. Um, uh, and they did have some victories. Um, they did succeed in creating 
little oases of, say, racial integration or racial diversity in metropolitan areas. Um, but the larger forces that were at work um, leading to disinvestment from central cities were pretty hard to stop. Mm -hmm. When I uh, have read your book, I said this is so pertinent to um, so many of the issues that we're currently facing and, and the debates we're, we're talking about. And I wondered, um, from you know, bringing the historical perspective uh, and, and tackling some of these current debates, um, what does it say to you about, for example, the debate about smart growth and urban sprawl? Um, are, uh, are, are these debates, um, you know, where does the history help us um, to think about those? Yeah, well, I think there's a, a, a symbiotic relationship between uh, sprawl and exurban development in our metropolitan areas and disinvestment from um, central cities. Uh, the two are part and parcel of the same process. Disinvestment um, is, you could say, um, the flip side of reinvestment or new investment that's occurring, particularly in outlying areas. It's no surprise that some of the most rapidly growing counties around major cities like Detroit or Chicago, some of the most rapidly growing communities with new housing development are also the whitest. Um, they're folks who are fleeing not just from the central city, but even from the inner ring suburbs um, that are becoming racially or ethnically heterogeneous. Um, and it's not just people fleeing, it's also people affirmatively choosing not to look for houses in um, ethnically or racially heterogeneous neighborhoods and instead looking in the homogenous places further out on the fringe. So the debate about smart growth to me in part is a debate, a, a debate about the environment, about um, the appropriate uses of, of the land, about you know, preserving landscapes, about um, preventing the kind of um, degradation to the environment that comes with spending lots of time in your car and long commutes and huge tracts of land being paved over for surface parking lots. But it's also uh, a, a question about where public policy puts its priorities, where we decide to channel our subsidies. And suburban and exurban development is happening in part because of tax policies, um, land use policies that are set by the state and by localities that make it easy or relatively easy for developers to build there versus oftentimes policies that provide real dissentives um, for developers or community organizations um, that are trying to do infill housing in, in um, or new commerce in, in urban areas that have been left behind. Mm -hmm. How about um, the whole area of um, fair housing? Um, that um, may be an area that we think has been tackled and um, there were many um, important law laws passed and lawsuits filed and so forth uh, in the past. And I, I know some of that is covered in your book in terms of doing away with restrictive covenants and other Blatant, uh, blatantly unfair uh, and raci uh, racially discriminatory practices. But um, where do you think we stand now with uh, respect to fair housing and, and what needs to be done? Fair housing is um, one of the most interesting and important um, subsets of the civil rights struggle, and you know, beginning in the 1940s and 1950s, and continuing up, you know for the next half century, but it's a, it's a movement that's lost a lot of its energy in recent years. Um, there are still very committed fair housing activists in nearly every major metropolitan area in the country, and there are you know, local and regional and national organizations committed to the idea of racial integration in housing. But um, it's telling that a lot of folks have sort of thrown up their hands and said, there's not much more we can do. This is a this is inevitable, or um, you know, what's to be gained by um, um, opening up or integrating housing markets? And I think the answer is there's a lot to be gained because where you live determines the quality of the education that your children get. It determines um, the kinds of public goods you get, infrastructure, um, community services, local government, um, and the taxes that you pay for it. Um, where you live also de de determines your access to the job market, to um, good shopping. I mean, live on and, you know on parts of, uh, of of Cleveland's east side or south side, and it's hard to find a good grocery store. Live out you know 15 miles away in one of the booming suburbs, and you've got a choice of, of usually several compelling places. These are things that affect people's everyday quality of life, and um, because uh, the assets, the uh, um, good public services in schools, good commercial districts tend to be concentrated in communities with large white populations. 
they provide real advantages for whites and conversely um, uh, real disadvantages to African Americans who are living in, in neighborhoods that have faced disinvestment and are remote from where commerce and jobs are, are growing rapidly. Are the strategies, though, that need to be drawn forth, have they, have they changed a lot, or have we just uh, l lost interest in the, in the previous strategies that, that were working and need to be pursued further? I think it's a little bit of both. Um, there are still ongoing, you know, significant local efforts to create integrated housing, Shaker Heights outside of Cleveland, Oak Park, in Chicago, uh, just outside of Chicago, my neighborhood in Philadelphia, Mount Airy. Um, these are well-known and, and nationally celebrated um, attempts to create racially diverse communities, but they're few and far between. There aren't a lot of places like them. Um, beginning in the late 60s and 1970s, grassroots fair housing activists began to push for changes in local zoning laws, uh, uh, changes in land use regulations um, as ways of creating more diverse housing, in, especially in communities that were using zoning laws to keep undesirables out. Um, but those were real uphill battles. They got, often got tied up in years of lawsuits and litigation and um, local city officials who supported um, changing zoning laws to uh, permit the construction of affordable housing often found themselves thrown out of office. Um, so they faced a lot of really serious obstacles. And to some extent, the, the real battleground should be in, 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 in the state capitals in terms of state policy um, about land use and housing. Um, but with the exception of a few states, that's been a real tough and uphill battle to fight. I'd like to move now to uh, some questions about your approach to, um, to I don't want to say studying history, but to, to using a historical analysis to uh, address these um, concerns about urban areas. It's a very localized approach, and it kind of builds up as, a, uh, as compared to maybe approaches that start from the top down and say, well, what's going on in the whole country, and uh, let's fly over a lot of cities. Um, what are the advantages to the local approach? A obviously, there's been a tremendous advantage. The book has won every award possible, so, but can you reflect on, um, on your approach? Yeah, well, I think looking at a locality gives you a chance to see the mechanisms at work that have created um, the metropolitan landscapes that, that we take for granted today. Um, when you do a national level study, um, it's easy to get really abstract and talk about um, you know, uh, the real estate market as an actor or federal policymakers as an actor. But you get down to the local level and you realize that federal policies are being implemented by local bureaucrats. And, um, the resistance to housing that's part of what we call the real estate market is, is being done by um, local real estate brokers and you can get into the records and find out what they're saying and doing and what their practices are. And you can find out also, the, as I did in Detroit and other scholars have now done for other cities, um, um, trace the history of grassroots white organizations that were formed to influence local politics and to um, uh, try to keep African Americans or keep racial integration from occurring in their neighborhoods. Um, there's an old saying by Tip O'Neill, you know, that all politics is local. And to a great extent in the United States, um, the localities, our cities and our suburbs, our communities, are still the battlegrounds where some of the most important issues in domestic public policy get fought over. And so to really understand them, um, uh, I think it's important to be aware of what's happening on the larger scale, nationally or internationally. Um, but you can really see it playing out and really understand it when you look at what's happening on the ground in the localities, which is the approach um, that I took in, in Origins. I'm glad to know where that quote, all politics is local, came from because um, it's an important one. And um, it, I, I, as someone who uh, works in urban affairs and urban issues, um, I have um, struggled myself with how to uh, take that local approach, but then use it to draw some con conclusions or some, some advocacy around national policy issues. Have you figured out um, that connection, how to move back and forth from those levels yet? Yeah, well, I, you know, pretty much all of my work, not just Origins of the Urban Crisis, but other, other books and articles I'm writing on, and the kind of work I do um, outside the academy, bringing my um, scholarship into um, you know, in, into the arena of policymaking um, is constantly thinking about the ways in which 
federal and state policies impact the local and the ways in which um, what's happening in the localities can sometimes be, you could say, the kind of the laboratories for looking at what kinds of public policies work, what kind fail, um, what kinds of experiments and economic development are successful, and, and what kind are problematic. Um, you know, planners and, and, uh, um, and policymakers often talk about looking for best practices, and localities give you a chance to, to identify best practices and worst practices, and to begin thinking about at the state or the national level fashioning public policies that can encourage um, practices at work and um, disincentivize or discourage uh, um, policies or practices that are problematic, that mm -hmm. reinforce inequality and, and and worsen the problems of, of uh, metropolitan areas. Mm -hmm. and, and since you're in Cleveland, I, I feel uh, like I'd like to ask you a, a few questions, that, not to put you on the spot, because I, I know you've made a few visits here, but don't, but, but don't know all about Cleveland. Um, but Cleveland I is ranked, um, in, in three out of the last four years, the poorest city in, in the United States, the city of Cleveland, not necessarily the whole metro area, which actually ranks much better. Um, but I wonder um, if you have some insights into the relationship in a city like Cleveland between um, uh, the, the, the racial uh, segregation patterns that you've described, the industrial changes that you s have seen in Detroit, uh, the urban sprawl, and so forth. And uh, what you know are th are those some? How do those forces pertain to where we've landed with our very high poverty ranking? Yeah. Well, Cleveland looks a lot like. Detroit, not in having one single industry that it relies on, but in undergoing a process of pretty significant um, disinvestment and deindustrialization, beginning in the seemingly prosperous post-Second World War II years. Um, and um, the loss of some of those key industries um, pulled a rung out of the economic ladder, um, particularly as African Americans were migrating in large numbers from the South to northern cities like here. Um, in search of jobs and economic opportunity. And so that was one thing that was happening um, that has long-term effects in, in uh, the impoverishment of residents of the central city. Another is the kinds of jobs that, that, that you see being created in Cleveland and in most other big cities um, uh, you know, tend to fall into um, two categories, jobs that are uh, open and available to people with high skills and jobs um, that don't require very many skills that are often um, poorly paid, often ununionized, often don't have a lot of benefits, um, and those kinds of low-scale service sector jobs that are being created um, uh, often leave the folks who are working hard at them um, in poverty or very close to um, the poverty level. It's, it's hard to, to find jobs, um, especially in central cities, um, for people without that many skills or education um, that allow them to be self-sufficient. Cleveland, like many other major cities, has also struggled with its public schools and in ways that um, limit the, 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 the skills that are available to its graduates in terms of going out and, and succeeding economically on the job market. Um, and Cleveland, like Detroit, like Chicago, like Philadelphia, like so many other big cities, has seen the most significant economic growth happening out on the periphery, away from the central city uh, and away from uh, uh, where people most in need of those jobs live. And it's often difficult, given um, the only partial adequacy of the public transportation system, for people to get easily from the center to you know, far out suburbs and exurbs where jobs are growing. Um, and so all of these things, in combination with each other, um, uh, have made Cleveland uh, a, a city that's among one of America's poorest. Um, and, and it's both long-term and, and short-term um, um, uh, changes that have had these really deep impacts. Thank you, Tom. I really appreciate you stepping away from your work in Detroit and, and helping us to think about Cleveland and, and how the lessons you learned through your historical analysis apply here. Um, we very much look forward to spending the next week with you and, and talking further about these issues. Thanks for having me.